In 2019, Meg Maurer was a 21-year-old senior at Tulane University in New Orleans, Louisiana. She was studying ecology and evolutionary biology and planned to pursue a career in scientific illustration after graduation. This was a field that combined her skill as a scientist, her incredible artistic ability, and her general love of nature. But despite her intellectual brilliance, what Meg was actually known for was her very uplifting personality. When her mother was asked what her daughter was like, she said, well, it's like trying to describe what it's like to feel the warmth of the sun. There are not words to accurately describe what that feels like. And that was Meg. She was radiant, she was joyous, she was adventuresome, she was kind. She was really just a wonderful person to be around. In March of that year, just two months before their graduation, Meg and two of her close friends decided to go on a trip for spring break. This would be their last spring break as students and they wanted to enjoy it. Because they were all in excellent physical condition, they decided they would spend the week hiking in Georgia. When Meg told her family about her big plans, they could tell she was extremely excited and they just told her, you know, be safe and we'll see you when you get back. On the morning of their departure, which was March 5th, Meg packed her suitcase into the trunk of her small green sedan and then she drove over to her two friends' apartment building and they came out and they put their suitcases into the car and then once the car was all packed and all three of them were inside, they hit the road. The drive from Tulane University to this area in Georgia where they'd be hiking took about eight hours if you didn't stop. But none of them were in a particularly big rush and so they figured they would just stop along the way and if they got to Georgia super late at night, so be it. After being on the road for two hours without stopping, they all needed to use the bathroom. And so Meg decided to pull over at the first rest stop she saw. And the first one she saw was in this residential town in Mississippi called Gaucher. So she pulls off the highway into this very nondescript rest stop and all three of them get out. They go into the main building and they use the restroom. Meg was the first one to be done. So she came outside and she waited right near the bathroom door. And then her two friends, they finished up as well. They came out and then the trio began walking back towards the parking lot where Meg's car was. At the same time, a man driving an 18-wheeler tractor-trailer truck was bombing down the highway right outside of this rest stop, and right before he was going to pass the area where this rest stop was, he heard something fall off the back of his truck. He instinctively checked both of his mirrors to see if maybe he could see what had fallen off, but he didn't see anything in the road, and so he just pulled over onto the shoulder and got out to see what was going on. When he walked towards the back of his truck, he expected to see, you know, maybe one of the back doors had popped open or something like that. But even before he made it to the back of his truck and could even look at those back doors, he already knew what had fallen off the truck. Two of his back tires were just gone. This truck had what's called dual rear wheels, which meant on the axle, there was not just one wheel on each side. Instead, there were two wheels on each side. So four wheels across one axle. And so each of these two wheels were bolted together and would turn at the same time and kind of functioned like one big fat tire. This gave the truck more stability and safety when it was towing. The driver in a panic looked back down the road in the direction he had just come, hoping to just see the tires somewhere, but they weren't anywhere to be found. And so not really knowing what to do, he just instinctively called his boss and told him what was going on. And his boss just said, hold tight, I will send help out to you. And so this driver is left to just stand on the side of the road and wait for help to arrive. And so as he's doing that, he's just staring back down the road in the direction he had just come as if these tires are just gonna magically appear. And as he's looking in this direction, he starts to notice on the other side of the highway, there are police cars and ambulances streaming into a rest stop that he had just passed. And it was the rest stop where Meg and her two friends had been. It would turn out when these two tires became dislodged from this truck, they went careening across the highway to the other side, across oncoming traffic, all the way up into this rest stop, and they crashed directly into Meg right as she was climbing back into her car. These two tires combined weighed almost 1,000 pounds. And so the impact killed Meg. She was pronounced dead on the scene. After an investigation, it was not conclusively determined what actually caused these tires to fall off. The likely cause was they were missing a small part known as a locking washer that costs $3 and is very easy to acquire. But regardless, at this point, the incident is considered a freak accident.
In January of 1997, a very accomplished and Ivy League trained American chemist named Karen Wetterhahn started experiencing tingling in her lower extremities. Now, it was uncomfortable, but it wasn't enough discomfort to warrant going to a doctor or really being concerned about it. She figured it was just something kind of minor and it would go away on its own. But shortly after this tingling began, Karen started noticing she was having balance issues. She would be walking down the hallway at the university where she worked when inexplicably she would just lose her balance and start stumbling and would either fall to the ground or would have to lean up against the wall to steady herself. She tried to convince herself that she was just being clumsy or that she was just really tired and that's what was causing it. But shortly after these balance issues presented themselves, Karen was hit with a host of other health issues. Her speech became awkwardly slow and slurred. She began hearing this white noise ringing in her ear that just wouldn't go away. And her field of vision drastically narrowed to the point where it was like she was looking through two toilet paper rolls. Karen's husband brought her to the hospital where she underwent this very lengthy and involved examination, which involved spinal taps and brain scans to try to figure out what was going on because at first, none of the doctors had any idea. After the testing was complete and Karen was sleeping in a hospital bed and her husband was sitting by her side, a doctor walked into the room with a clipboard and he had this odd look on his face, like the news he was about to deliver he didn't really even understand. And so he consulted his clipboard one more time, looking at some paperwork, and then he looked up and he looked at Karen, and then he turned to Karen's husband, and he just says to him, Sir, does your wife have any enemies? It would turn out Karen was suffering from a severe case of mercury toxicity. Mercury is a naturally occurring metallic element that is poisonous to humans in all its forms. And Karen had so much mercury in her body, in fact, she had 80 times the toxic threshold, that doctors believed this had to have been an intentional poisoning, that someone must have attacked Karen trying to kill her with mercury. But Karen's husband said, you know, I don't think my wife has any enemies. And then when Karen ultimately woke up, she reiterated that sentiment that she did not have any enemies. The doctors who knew Karen was a chemist, they asked her, you know, have you had any recent exposure to mercury? And through slurred and difficult to understand speech, Karen would say that she had. In fact, over the last six months leading up to this hospital visit, Karen had had lots of exposure to mercury because she was actually in charge of this huge $7 million research project that was looking to investigate the effect certain metals had on human health. And one of the metals she was studying was mercury. But Karen assured the doctor that anytime she handled any of these metals, she was always very, very cautious, especially when she handled mercury because she understood how hazardous it was. She said she always wore the proper protective equipment to make sure none of the substances made contact with her skin. And she worked under this big chemical hood, which is like a big vacuum, to ensure she didn't accidentally inhale any of the toxic fumes that came off of these metals. The doctor was totally stumped and went silent for a second. And then Karen at some point broke the silence by saying, well, you know, there was one time I did have a spill with mercury, but it was totally meaningless. And I haven't thought about it until just now, only because we're trying to figure out what happened. She would go on to tell the doctor about an incident that occurred five months earlier. She had been working at her lab at the university where she was employed when she accidentally spilled one or two tiny drops of mercury onto the top of her left hand near her thumb. Now, she was wearing all of the prescribed protective equipment, including latex gloves on her hand. And so when she saw these droplets on her hand, she wasn't concerned for her health. She just followed procedure. She stopped what she was doing. She wiped the droplets off and then she left her workstation. She threw away the contaminated gloves. She thoroughly washed her hands and then put new gloves on and then just went back to work and didn't think much of it. The type of mercury that Karen had spilled on her hand was called dimethyl mercury. This is not the same thing as the shiny silver liquid we see in old thermometers. That is a hazardous substance, but it's nothing compared to dimethyl mercury. Dimethyl mercury is a clear liquid that is considered to be one of the most toxic substances on the planet. After hearing this story from Karen, the doctor agreed that overall this did seem like a kind of meaningless event because she had followed all the proper procedures and those droplets had landed on her gloves 
gloves, not on her skin, but since they had no other leads to operate on, he thought it would still be a good idea to test to see if dimethylmercury could penetrate through latex. And sure enough, after they ran some studies, they found it could. In fact, the latex gloves that all these scientists were told to wear when handling this particular substance, they did nothing. The dimethylmercury would penetrate through the latex in seconds. But even though they had just solved the mystery of how Karen got mercury toxicity in the first place, what no one could understand was why Karen was still suffering from the effects of mercury toxicity if her only exposure to it was five months earlier, just that at one time. Typically, people who have mercury toxicity, they will get better as soon as the source of their toxicity is removed. Meaning, when the mercury goes away, they get better. And it's because the mercury kind of pools in their bloodstream and their body will naturally excrete it and they'll get better. But unfortunately for Karen, it would turn out dimethylmercury is a little bit different. It's far more lipophilic than other types of mercury. Lipophilic means a chemical substance is more likely to bind and mix with fat tissue in the body. And since blood is primarily made of water, when dimethylmercury enters the body, it does not settle in the bloodstream. Instead, it settles in organs that are made up of primarily fat. And once dimethylmercury is in your organs, it takes an exponentially longer amount of time for your body to excrete it, if it ever does. Sometimes you just die from the effects of mercury toxicity before your body can get rid of it. And in Karen's case, when she showed up to the hospital, it was already too late. Some of the dimethylmercury had already made its way up to her brain, which is an organ made up of 60% fat, and there it began to destroy her central nervous system. Three weeks after being admitted to the hospital, Karen fell into a coma, and then shortly after, one of Karen's friends was in the hospital visiting her, and she saw a tear was coming down Karen's face. And so the friend turned to the doctor and said, you know, is she in pain? Is that why she's crying? And the doctor said, no, it doesn't appear her brain is able to register pain anymore. Karen would unfortunately never wake up from her coma. She would pass away on June 8th, 1997, roughly 10 months after those little droplets of dimethylmercury landed on her her latex glove. In the 1850s and 1860s, Edwin Booth was the man. He was this extremely famous American actor who basically anywhere he went in America, people would know who he was. He was extremely recognizable, a household name, an A-list celebrity through and through. But his acting prowess and his career and his fame, those are not the things we remember him for. In early 1865, when Edwin was 31 years old and was at the height of his acting fame, he walked into a New Jersey train station and walked through the building to the actual platform where the trains are. And as soon as he turned a corner and actually saw the train that he wanted to board, he very quickly realized that he probably was not going to get on that train. There was already this huge throng of people out on the platform pressed up against the side of this train and they're all waving their arms around and yelling. And in the middle of this big group of people with his back pressed up against the train was the train's conductor whose job was to sell tickets in addition to driving the train. But from Edwin's perspective, it seemed fairly obvious based on the conductor's body language and what some of the people in the crowd were yelling that there just weren't enough tickets. That's why this big unruly group had formed because all these people were rushing forward trying to buy one of the last few tickets. Now, Edwin could have very easily just walked up and announced himself and shown his very famous face, and almost certainly he would have gotten a ticket. But to this point, Edwin had not been recognized in this train station, and so he wanted to keep a low profile, and so he decided against that idea. Instead, he decided he would just kind of join this big group and, you know, try to flag down the conductor and try to buy one of these tickets, and if he didn't, so be it. And so Edwin, instead of going to the back of this group, he went around to the right side, close up against the side of the train, and right as he got to the outside of the group and he turned in towards the group, he looked up at where the conductor was and he saw the conductor turning around and walking back into the train. He had clearly sold all of his tickets, and so anyone who had not purchased one yet, like Edwin, they were out of luck. They'd have to wait for the next train. Edwin was about to just walk away and wait for the next train when he noticed the crowd in front of him, they didn't disperse like he was doing. Instead, they all seemed to kind of surge forward towards the train, which was now moving. And as they pushed forward as if they were gonna jump onto this train, even though they didn't have tickets, 
one man who was towards the front of this group, right up against the train, he falls to the ground and gets trapped halfway under the train. His lower half was literally on the tracks under the train, and his upper half is now under this big crowd of people that are now trampling him. And so Edwin can see very clearly that if someone does not grab this guy and pull him out soon, he's going to get run over by the train. And so Edwin, without any hesitation, he jumps forward onto the ground on the platform and he reaches his hand out through the feet of all these people in this crowd and he grabs the collar of the guy who had fallen and he pulls him. And as he's pulling him, this guy who's on his back, he starts pushing with his legs and his feet. And within about a fraction of a second, they yank him out from under the train and the guy who had fallen and Edwin are lying on their backs on the platform. And before they could even talk to each other, they sat up and watched as a big train wheel rolled over that piece of track where this guy had just been laying. Edwin had saved his life. The guy he had saved was a 21 year old named Robert. And so the two of them, they stand up and they face each other for the first time. And when Robert sees Edwin, he gasps because this is Edwin Booth, the mega celebrity. He could not believe that was the guy who had just saved him. And while Robert was very thankful, he also was just totally dumbfounded at the absurdity of the situation he was in. And so eventually Edwin just says, you know, hey, you know, I'm glad I was here to help you. You know, no big deal. Next time be more careful. And then at some point the men just shook hands and parted ways. Edwin would eventually get on the next train and he would go wherever it was he needed to go. And before long, his very busy schedule kind of occupied his mind and he had kind of forgotten about what happened on the train platform. But a few days later, Edwin got a letter in the mail from a very high ranking government official thanking him for saving Robert's life. Because it would turn out Robert Lincoln was the eldest son of the then president of the United States, Abraham Lincoln. Now, to be clear, Edwin was extremely famous and had lots and lots of influence and knew lots of very important people, but he had never had any interaction with anyone in the Lincoln family before he met Robert on the train platform. So it was just a crazy coincidence that this mega celebrity happened to save the life of the president's son. But this coincidence was nothing compared to the coincidence that occurred next. On the evening of April 14th, 1865, so roughly three months after Edwin saved Robert, Robert's father, President Lincoln, sat down in a private seating area to watch a play at a Washington DC theater. During the production at around 10.15 PM, a man snuck in to the private seating area and shot the president to death. The killer was Edwin's younger brother, John Wilkes Booth. This assassination had nothing to do with Edwin or his interaction with Robert on the train platform. This was an assassination that was formulated and carried out completely independently, meaning it was purely coincidence that just a few months after Edwin saved a Lincoln's life, his own brother took a Lincoln's life. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please replace the like button's default internet browser with Microsoft Edge. In 2006, Heather Kwan was a 21-year-old college student living in the small residential town of Desert Hills in Arizona. From a very young age, Heather was someone who always seemed to give her friendship to the people who needed it the most. People who were hurting on the inside or who society had kind of forgotten about. This is why when she was a teenager and a young adult, she would often spend her weekends volunteering her time with underprivileged children. It's also why she aspired to go to law school and become a defense lawyer because she loved the idea of professionally helping people that desperately needed her help. She lived in a rental home with her boyfriend who was 18 years old. His name was Ryan Waller. And amongst other things, he was a huge gun enthusiast and a student. That year, the couple had made plans to visit Ryan's father, Don, on Christmas Day, so on December 25th. But when the day came and Don had made dinner for the couple and was expecting them, they didn't show up. And so Don tried contacting both of them, but when he couldn't, he just had a bad feeling that something was off. It was just very uncharacteristic of them to just no-show. But instead of driving over to their property himself, Don just called the local police and asked them to do a welfare check. The police arrived at the house in Desert Hills, Arizona. They knocked on the door, but there was no answer. They looked in the windows and some lights were on, but it was mostly dark inside. And they couldn't really tell from the car in the driveway if that belonged to the homeowners or somebody else. And so they stood 
there for a second. They're looking in the windows. There's no movement. They knock again while simultaneously calling out that, hey, we're the police. We're here to do a welfare check. Just want to make sure you guys are okay. And this time, after they were done knocking, they heard the deadbolt unlock and then the door swung inward into the house and standing right in front of them was Ryan. Ryan had this huge bruise on his left eye, this big black eye, and he had a cut on his nose and he was just standing there, not saying anything, not asking any questions, just looking at them. And they looked past Ryan into his house and they saw there was a woman lying on the couch, which they presumed was his girlfriend, Heather, because that was the two people they were coming to look for. And so they turned their attention back to Ryan and they asked him, you know, what happened to your eye? And Ryan was a little bit cagey. He didn't really give them a straight answer. He basically said, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know what happened to my eye. And, you know, the police didn't really pry that much, but eventually they determined that Ryan was more or less okay, albeit a little bit strange. And then they said, okay, well, who's the woman who's lying on the couch? Is that Heather? And Ryan, again, was kind of cagey and a little bit dismissive and said something along the lines of, oh, you know, she's just sleeping. And so the police said to him, look, you know, we're here on a welfare check. Your father sent us here to check on you guys. And so we have to go in there and wake her up and make sure she's okay. And so Ryan, again, was just a little bit weird and kind of defensive and didn't really immediately comply, but eventually did step out of the way. And the police walked into the residence. They walked over to the couch. And as soon as they looked down at the girl on the couch, which was Heather, they saw right away that she was not asleep. She was dead. And she had been for at least a couple of days. She had died from a single gunshot wound to the head. Immediately, Ryan was arrested and brought out to a squad car. He didn't fight the arrest, but he did emphatically say he didn't know what was going on. He didn't understand what was happening. He didn't know what happened to Heather. He just seemed kind of generally confused. But regardless, he was thrown in the back of the police car outside the property, and he would sit there for several hours while more and more police and paramedics arrived to process the crime scene and also to transfer Heather's body to a morgue. Finally, around 5 a.m. on December 26th, the police brought Ryan, who was still in the back of this police car, to the Phoenix police station for questioning. The interrogation that followed, this hour-long interrogation that was all filmed, would start off relatively normally, but it would quickly devolve into this totally bizarre back and forth between Ryan and the detective who was questioning him. And then at the end of the interrogation, there would be this stunning revelation. From this point until the end of today's video, we're going to be showing you clips from the actual interrogation. When you get to the end of this video and you hear the revelation, and trust me, you will not miss it, I would encourage you to then go back and watch the clips of the interrogation or just go online and watch the entire interrogation because it's totally mind-blowing watching this thing knowing what's really going on. In the video, Ryan is led into this sort of nondescript, small interrogation room at 5.08 a.m. on December 26th. So he's just arrived at the station. They put him in this room. He's wearing this white jumpsuit that might have been issued by police. Maybe he owned it, but it definitely looks more like prison attire. He's got no shoes on, no socks on, and his hands are not cuffed. And so he walks into the room and he sits down in the chair that's in the back corner of the interrogation room. And this chair is right next to this table. And then on the other side of this table is another chair. And so Ryan sits down in the corner. He's kind of facing out towards the middle of the room. He's quiet. He's basically not moving. And then at some point, he notices there is a handcuff that's connected to this table. Now, in some cases, the police would handcuff the person they were interviewing in this room. But in this case, Ryan was not told that he needed to put this handcuff on. He was uncuffed. So there was no directive that he needed to have this handcuff on. After handcuffing himself to this table, Ryan turns and puts his arms over this table and he lays down, puts his head in his arms, and he lays that way for about five minutes. Periodically, he makes a few groaning sounds, but for the most part, he's quiet. And then all of a sudden, as he's laying there, he suddenly makes a fairly loud moaning sound and he stands up in his chair like he's gonna walk out of the room. But as soon as he starts to walk away, the handcuff stops him. The handcuff that he was not told to put on. 
And so he's stuck against this table, but he doesn't seem phased by it. He looks almost confused by what's happening, but he doesn't dwell on it for very long. Instead, he just reaches across the table and grabs a blank piece of paper, and then he just sits back down in the seat, he crosses his legs, and he starts looking at this piece of paper. At 5.17 a.m., so roughly nine minutes into this interrogation, which really hasn't even started yet, Ryan is intently looking at this blank piece of paper when a detective walks into the interrogation room. This detective was named Dalton, and he informs Ryan that they're going to be taking pictures of his feet, and so he needs to put his feet up on the table that's right next to him. Ryan, at first, acts very confused and doesn't really understand what's happening, but he eventually complies and he puts his feet up on the table, and by the time his feet are up there, another officer walks into the interrogation room, and he's got a camera, and he's got this big kit with him, and he would begin about a 10 minute long process of photographing Ryan's feet and also swabbing Ryan's feet. During this 10 minute session, Dalton stays in the room, and so Ryan periodically asks him if he can just leave and go home, seemingly unaware of how serious the situation really was for him. And when Dalton would tell him, no, you can't leave, Ryan would act totally frustrated and kind of angry and upset, kind of like how a child would act if they were told they couldn't have something they really wanted to. At 5.28 a.m., after this 10 minute session is complete and they've photographed and swabbed Ryan's feet, the second officer leaves the room and Dalton shuts the door behind him and then he walks over to the table and he grabs the chair on the other side from Ryan. He drags it out so it's closer to Ryan and then he sits down and introduces himself. After that, he begins asking Ryan some very basic questions. He asks him to confirm his name, which he does. He asks him to confirm his date of birth and his social security number and Ryan does both those things. And then he asks Ryan if he understands why he was there, why he was being interrogated. And Ryan says, no. And so at this point, Dalton says, okay, you know, let's just stop right now. I'm going to read you your rights. And so it's at this point in the interrogation that Ryan's behavior starts to get really, really weird. After Dalton tells Ryan he needs to read him his rights, you can see Ryan doesn't compute what he's saying. He's just kind of looking blankly and Dalton seems to pick up on that. And so he tries to make it kind of lighthearted and he says, you know, hey, Ryan, I'm going to read you your rights like they do on TV, you know, like on cops and on Law and Order and CSI and those crime shows, they read people their rights. That's what I'm going to do. You know what I'm talking about? And Ryan just goes, no. And Dalton's kind of confused. He's like, you haven't seen any cop show where they read people their rights? And at this, Ryan kind of changes his behavior. And suddenly he's not as robotic. He's a little bit defensive looking. And he says, oh, yeah, I have. Yeah. At this, it's pretty obvious to Dalton that Ryan is lying about something that is totally insignificant, whether or not he's seen true crime TV shows. It really just didn't matter at all. And there's this weird hesitation where both of them are just kind of being quiet for a minute. It's like Dalton knows he's lying about it, and Ryan just seems totally confused. And then ultimately, Dalton just decides to not key in on this kind of weird lie that Ryan has just told. Instead, he just reads Ryan his rights. And then after that, he gets back into some basic questions. The next one was, hey Ryan, what was the highest grade you achieved in school? And now at this point, Ryan is not looking at Dalton. He's looking to the far side of the room. He's got this blank expression on. And when he's asked this question, he just says, I don't know. And Dalton's like, you don't know what level grade you achieved in school? And Ryan says, no, I don't know. Uh, eighth, eighth grade. So again, he's changed his answer fairly abruptly when he's challenged. And so Dalton is probably thinking to himself that he's lying again. But again, it's just kind of an insignificant thing, but it's building a pattern of mistrust here. It's hard for Dalton to believe that Ryan is going to be truthful if he can't even tell the truth about things that don't matter. But Dalton decides not to fixate on it. Instead, he asks a follow-up question based on the fact that Ryan has said eighth grade is the highest level he achieved. And so Dalton says, okay, well, did you get your GED? A GED is a high school diploma equivalent, and it's something you would get if you did not graduate high school. And since eighth grade is below high school, then Ryan clearly did not finish high school. And so it's a natural question to ask. The answer to this question is binary. You have a GED, you don't have a GED. But Ryan's answer is anything but binary. It's totally contradictory and weird, and it really begins to show a side of Ryan that just doesn't add up. He's acting totally weird. Do you have a GED? I don't know. I don't know what? I don't know. I don't know. I just want to go home. Oh, you're, you're not going to go home right now. So 
four. What's the highest grade that you completed? B? No. Not, not grade, as in letter grade. I'm asking, did you graduate high school? No. And the highest you went was eighth grade? Mm -hmm. Yep. Do you know how to read and write, Ryan? Yeah. After the discussion about Ryan's education goes nowhere, Dalton again does not fixate on all the issues with his answers so far, and instead just kind of continues asking more questions. And so he begins to address Heather. He starts by asking Ryan if he has a girlfriend. Now, Dalton at this point would know that Heather, the girl who was deceased, was Ryan's girlfriend because the police were asked to do the initial welfare check on Ryan and Heather, the couple. That's something that Don would have relayed to police. And so Dalton knows they have a relationship but he wants Ryan to tell him he has a relationship with Heather. So again, he asks Ryan, you know, do you have a girlfriend? And Ryan says, no, which is a lie. But Dalton goes along with it and says, okay, well, do you know a girl named Heather? And Ryan would say, yes, I do. But his description of Heather was just completely inaccurate. He said Heather was a 16 or 17 year old girl, even though she was actually 21. And he would say her last name was Kaiman. He thought, he wasn't entirely sure. He said she has nicknames and she has different names she uses but he believes it's Kaiman, even though her last name was actually Quan. Now, Dalton, of course, is aware of these discrepancies, but again, he does not fixate on them. He just keeps on asking more questions. Dalton asks Ryan, what happened to your face? You have this huge bruise on the left side of your face. You know, what happened? At first, Ryan says he doesn't know. But when Dalton pressed him and kept asking more and more questions about his face and how it happened, Ryan eventually would begin to open up. What happened to your face? I don't know. You told the officer just a few minutes ago that someone hit you. Do you remember who hit you? Um, I don't know. I think it was Heather. Why would Heather hit you? I don't know. It was an accident. I forgot why. Like the other police officers involved, Dalton believed already going into this interrogation that Ryan killed Heather, that the bruise on his face was from Heather fighting back before ultimately Ryan killed her. And so for Ryan to say, the mark on my face is from Heather, even though he claimed it was an accident, to Dalton, that was the same thing as Ryan saying, I killed Heather. Dalton attempted to get more specific details about the actual physical struggle that took place between Ryan and Heather, but as he asked more and more questions, he became more and more aggressive, and it seemed like Ryan picked up on it and became very defensive and started throwing out random pieces of information, much of which seemed untrue. Like he suggested there was at least two or three other people that were in the house on the night that Heather got killed, but it's unclear if these people were real or if they were actually ever there. And it just seemed like Ryan was kind of panicking and just kind of saying all sorts of random things. And so at some point, Dalton just wants to focus the conversation because he feels like it's getting totally out of hand. And so he just stops Ryan and he says, Ryan, there is a dead girl in your house and I need information. Hey, Ryan? Huh? Huh? There's a dead girl in your living room. She's dead? Yes. Heather? I don't know. I want to know what happened in your house last night. The girl on the couch is dead? I don't know. If she's on the couch, she's dead. The interesting thing about Ryan's reaction to being told by Dalton for the first time in the interrogation that there was a dead girl in his house is Ryan reacted with genuine surprise. It's the only time in the entire interrogation start to finish where Ryan sits forward in his chair, he kind of perks up and he seems relatively normal. He's not acting confused and kind of bizarre. It's like he's really dialed in as if he had not heard this before, that he didn't know Heather was dead and he's now for the first time being told and it shocked his system. 
But just seconds after he sits forward and seems really engaged, he goes back to kind of being totally bizarre. And he also suddenly had this really elaborate story about what happened to Heather, even though just seconds ago, it seemed like he had just learned about it. So it didn't really make any sense that he would have a story so readily available for something he seemed to not know anything about. And of course, like all of his other answers, his story he gave was full of contradictions and holes and was just totally unbelievable. Well, these people came over, Richie and his dad, with shooting and arrow bow and darts. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. They hit me and her with those. That's it. They hit you and... They hit you? Yeah. Now it's Richie that hit you, not Heather? No, Richie and his dad. Richie and his dad. They hit you? Yes. Why? Because they're trying to get their stuff. I don't know why. And they had some kind of bow and arrows? Mm-hmm. They each had two revolvers and they didn't let off any shells. Okay, you just said they had bow and arrows. Now they have revolvers? That's what I meant. They have revolvers. They have revolvers? Uh, yes. And then what happened? And then they shot us with those. Following this exchange, Ryan would change his story again and would say, actually, they didn't shoot me. They just shot Heather. They put me in a sleeper hold. But when Dalton asked him, what do you mean sleeper hold? Ryan said, oh, I don't know what a sleeper hold is. And then eventually Ryan would actually just ditch the sleeper hold narrative and go back to the Richie and his father. They came in and they shot both of us. At this point, Ryan's story has become so convoluted and it's changed so many times that it's just totally unbelievable. And so Dalton, who was doing his best to kind of go along with Ryan's story, at this point just can't even pretend anymore. He cannot pretend that he's following the story. It doesn't make any sense. You're telling me, you're, you're all over the board here, number one. You're saying bows and arrows, you're saying revolvers, and you're saying some other thing, and they, you're saying they shot you in the eye. Okay? They shot you with a revolver in your eye. Yes. And that's Is it. Is it a BB gun? No, it was a real gun, man. It was just a if revolver. They shot you in the eye with a revolver. You wouldn't be talking to me right now. How do you know? It was most likely you'd be dead. That's what I thought too, man. I really don't know. So you got shot first? Uh huh. And what happened? Did you fall to the ground? Yeah, I was trying to get up and I couldn't. I don't okay. know. And then she got shot? Mm hmm. What, why, what, what did you do? Nothing. Did you call 911? Uh -uh. Did you see if she was alive? She was sleeping still, and that's it. I just let her sleep. She got shot in the side of the face, and you let her sleep? Yes. This does not make sense, Ryan. After this exchange, Dalton just goes full bad cop on Ryan, openly accusing him of shooting and killing Heather. And Ryan just continues to say he doesn't know anything, that he didn't do it. And his answers are just totally nonsensical and contradictory and nothing is making sense. And so finally at 5.52 AM, roughly 45 minutes into this interrogation, Dalton is just at a loss. He does not know how to handle Ryan because even though he really believes he did it, nothing Ryan has said has incriminated him because Nothing Ryan has said makes any sense. And so he's sitting there kind of thinking what he's gonna do next. And then Dalton notices something. He notices something on Ryan's face. He tells Ryan to come closer. He needs to look at it. Let me see your nose. Put your, put, your legs, put your legs down. Put your legs down. Bring, bring your face closer. Bring your face closer. Oh, my head hurts. Okay. What Dalton had finally just discovered were four bullet holes in Ryan's face and head. Ryan had committed no crime. 
He was a victim the same way Heather was a victim, but somehow Ryan had survived the attack. On December 23rd, so two days before the welfare check, two men attempted to break into Ryan and Heather's house. They were 23-year-old Richie Carver and his 54-year-old father, Larry Carver, the same Richie and Richie's father that Ryan had mentioned during the interrogation. They were there because of an altercation that had occurred between Richie and the couple about a month earlier. During that time, Richie was actually living with Ryan and Heather, but apparently he began hitting on Heather and Heather told Ryan and Ryan got really mad about it and Ryan and Richie got in this big fight and ultimately Ryan kicks Richie out of the house. Now this totally infuriates Richie and is very embarrassing for Richie. And so right away he begins plotting his revenge. And so on December 23rd, Richie and his father, they were there to carry out this revenge plot. When the father and son got to the back of Ryan and Heather's house, Ryan saw them at the back door through the glass door that was near their kitchen and he ran over to try to stop them from getting inside. But Richie and Larry managed to barely get open the door and Richie reached in with his hand, which was carrying a gun, and he shot Ryan point blank twice in the face. The first bullet went in through his nose and then out the other side of his nose. So that's the first two bullet holes. And then that bullet traveled back into his head through his left eye into his brain where it got lodged. And along with the bullet, six pieces of his skull that broke off from this bullet went inside of his brain as well. So that's the first three bullet holes. And then the second bullet that was fired into Ryan's head hit the side of his head. It did not penetrate into his skull. So the bullet didn't lodge anywhere inside of his brain. However, it did break off a piece of his skull. And so that was the fourth bullet hole. Ryan dropped to the ground. He was unconscious. They assumed he was dead. They managed to force the door the rest of the way open. They stepped inside. They stepped over Ryan's body and they walked into the living room where Heather was cowering on the sofa and Richie just immediately walked up, put a gun to her head and fired a single shot. After she had fallen to the ground, the two men stole some things in the house and then fled the scene. They would ultimately get caught and they're both currently serving life sentences. It's believed Heather died instantly from her gunshot wound, but Ryan didn't. At some point, maybe a couple of hours after he was shot, he woke up, but he had severe brain damage and he wouldn't have known what was going on. He didn't really know what happened. And he saw his girlfriend, Heather, lying on the couch, but he thought she was just sleeping. And so he too went to his bedroom and he fell asleep. But the next morning he woke up and he still would have had no idea what was going on. And he spent the day on the 24th, just kind of wandering around his house with his girlfriend lying dead on the couch. And so after a full day of just kind of mindlessly walking around his house, he went back to bed and then he got up on Christmas day on the 25th and spent another day just kind of walking about his house with his girlfriend who he believed was sleeping, but really she was dead. And so finally the welfare check is called in, the police show up, and as soon as they see Ryan, they jumped to conclusions that he must have killed Heather. And it kind of dictated the way they treated him. Had they believed he was a victim, they might have sought medical attention for the wound on his face, but again, jumping to conclusions and assuming he was the killer, they figured that bruise on his face was from the woman fighting back. She had struck him before he had savagely killed her. And so they didn't give him any medical care. Instead, they put him out in the cop car out front of the property and he sat there with no medical intervention for six hours. And during those six hours, literally every second that went by, there was irreversible brain damage being caused because he had all this bleeding inside of his head that was causing brain damage. And so the clock was ticking as soon as they found him. And for hours and hours and hours, he got no care and was just getting worse and worse and worse. And so finally he goes to the police station. And again, they do not give him any medical care. Instead, they interrogate him for almost two hours, even though he has four bullet holes on his face that apparently no one noticed or no one took seriously. But regardless, he spent those almost two more hours in the interrogation room where every second that's going by, his brain is getting more and more destroyed, irreparably destroyed. And then finally, at the end of the interrogation, Dalton, who's probably thinking to himself, what is wrong with this guy? His answers don't make any sense. He's all over the place. And that's when he stepped back from looking for a way to convict this guy and noticed the holes on his face, specifically the hole in his nose. 
And that's when he called him forward and he looked at his face and he realized a huge mistake had been made and he called an ambulance. Here is a clip of the fire department who arrived ahead of the ambulance in the interrogation room, learning about what's happened to Ryan as they wait for the ambulance. Hey guys. Captain, you're not going to believe this one. I can't believe it either. You're right. I've already heard the story. I can't believe it. Oh, this is just my observations that this might be an entrance, this might be an exit, this might be into his eye. And he's acting uh, like he has a serious head injury, which would make sense. Ryan was ultimately rushed to the hospital where he would undergo emergency surgery that would save his life, but it would come at a great cost. They not only had to remove a large portion of his brain, but they also had to remove both of his eyes. Now, it should be noted that at least one other source says he only had his left eye removed, but regardless, after the surgery, Ryan was no longer independent. He had so much brain damage, he couldn't take care of himself, and so he had to move back in with his parents, who became his full-time caretakers. And then 10 years later, Ryan would die from a seizure that was directly connected to the injuries he sustained from that attack and it's connected to the lack of care he received in those first critical eight hours after the police found him. The Phoenix Police Department, after this mishandling of Brian's case went public, they did an internal investigation, but no one was ever disciplined, at least not publicly. As for Ryan's family, they certainly could have filed a lawsuit against the Phoenix Police Department, but they chose not to. They said, the only thing we want is our son back, and a lawsuit will not give us that. So that's gonna do it guys. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please offer to make the like button a sandwich of their choosing. But when you make it, make sure you construct it between two very thin, stale rye bread heels. Austin Haruf was born on December 21st, 1996 to a dentist and a pharmacist. They lived in a beautiful home in Palm Beach County, Florida, which is not only one of the nicest and wealthiest places to live in Florida, but it is one of the nicest and wealthiest places to live in all of America. And that's why as of 2021, there are 44 billionaires that call this paradise their home. In 2010, when Austin was 13 years old, his parents suddenly got divorced. And within the same calendar year, both of his parents had new girlfriends and boyfriends. Now, of course, this was a shock to Austin and to his one year younger sister, Haley, but they both relatively quickly adjusted to their new normal. And that was in large part because the kids didn't move out. They stayed in the family home with their mom and their father, he did move out, but he moved into a home that was very close by. About a year after the divorce, Austin began high school and immediately he excelled. He was placed into all advanced classes and within these advanced classes, Austin was consistently at the top of his class. Austin was also a big athletic guy. He was about six feet tall and weighed about 200 pounds. And so naturally he played football for all four years he was in high school. And for one year, his sophomore year, he also wrestled. But despite his size and willingness to play these very rough physical sports, Austin was not an aggressive guy. In fact, his football coaches actually used to criticize him for not being aggressive enough. And on game days, they would try to make him mad in hopes that would inspire him to go out there and smash some people. But it really didn't work because Austin was Austin. He was just kind of a laid back guy who was actually much more interested in helping people than smashing them. In fact, towards the end of high school, Austin became obsessed with trying to identify a career that would allow him to help the most people. And he was so passionate about this that when he spoke about it, a huge smile would kind of involuntarily appear on his face. And so because of this, and because of Austin's generally happy disposition, his father very lovingly began referring to him as the happy boy. Shortly before Austin's graduation in 2015, he received a letter in the mail from Florida State University, and it was informing him he had been accepted into their four-year pre-med program. Austin had settled on medicine as being his intended career path to help the most people. And so being accepted into this very prestigious program was like a best case scenario. And so Austin and his family were elated. And that summer that followed his high school graduation was totally charmed. 
Austin was on cloud nine. He spent a lot of time with his family and his friends. And then finally, at the end of the summer, his family packed all of his stuff into the car and they drove six hours north to Tallahassee where the Florida State campus was. They helped move him into his dorm and then afterwards they gave him a big hug, said good luck, and they left. And I'm sure on their ride back, the family members thought to themselves, Austin is doing so great. He is not only ready for college, he is ready to be an adult. He's ready to live on his own and be responsible. And at the end of Austin's first year in college, that supposition about him ready to be an adult seemed to be accurate. Austin got excellent grades, he met a nice girlfriend, and even though he wasn't playing organized sports like football, he had found another athletic outlet in bodybuilding, and he had actually built a decent-sized social media presence around bodybuilding and fitness. But underneath all of this public success Austin was having that year, he was actually struggling a lot of the time, he just wasn't telling anyone. In a journal he kept, he documented a deep sense of inadequacy caused primarily from his sense that his peers didn't accept him. And so he would write endlessly about how if he could just stop being so shy and be more assertive and outgoing, that more people would embrace him and would like him and would accept him. Over the course of that year, Austin also started abusing different substances. Those included things like alcohol, marijuana, and Vyvanse. Vyvanse is a drug that is a stimulant and it's used to treat people with attention deficit disorder. He also experimented with hallucinogenic drugs like acid and mushrooms. And he also tried MDMA, which is kind of like a cross between a stimulant and a hallucinogenic. And those are just the drugs that we are aware he was taking. It's entirely possible he was taking other drugs too. Regardless, Austin began oscillating between the high of whatever drug or combination of drugs he was on to the low of his sober mind, which was totally saturated with anxious and depressive thoughts. Before the end of the school year, Austin was secretly poised for a full-blown mental breakdown, and it seemed like he knew it was coming too. In the last month before the end of school, his internet search history is filled with questions like, I think I'm crazy, what do I do? And how do you know if you're crazy? And how to deal with obsessive thoughts? And do I need to sleep? And what happens if you don't sleep? it was clear he was starting to question his own sanity. When Austin finally returned back home from Florida State that summer, his family immediately noticed there was something wrong with Austin. Within a few days of being home, Austin had moved his bed from his bedroom down into the garage, claiming that the reason he did this was because the house was full of demons. At night, instead of sleeping, Austin would patrol the house. He would literally just walk all around the house all night, never stopping, and every two hours he would knock on the bedroom doors of his family members and loudly announce that he was guarding them from the demons in the house. Now, you can imagine how his family felt at the time. This was so unbelievably weird and totally out of character that they just didn't really know what to do. Even though it was obvious there was something wrong, they didn't jump into action. Instead, the only thing they did at first was to just start locking their bedroom doors at night to prevent Austin from coming inside during his night time patrols. But as the summer progressed and Austin continued to act totally weird with no explanation, his family began to become convinced that he must be on drugs, that that is what would explain all of this totally strange behavior. And so when they confronted him about his drug use, he would admit that he was taking drugs, lots of different drugs, psychedelics, stimulants, you name it, he's taking all these drugs. And so naturally his family latched on to his drug use as being the root cause of his very strange behavior. And so they focused their efforts almost exclusively on getting Austin clean again. But towards the end of the summer, Austin said he wasn't taking any drugs, but Austin was still acting totally crazy and unhinged. And so around mid-August, the family decided they had to utilize something called the Baker Act. Under the Baker Act, individuals in Florida who are suspected of severe mental illness can be detained for up to 72 hours at the behest of their loved ones. And during these 72 hours, this individual is thoroughly assessed to see what's going on with them. And then at the end of those 72 hours, they are given a treatment plan that their family is supposed to help them enact. But before the family could utilize the Baker Act, something horrific happened. On the morning of August 15th, one of Austin's very close friends, who he had known since second grade, said Austin just showed up at his house without calling ahead of time or letting him know, which was very uncharacteristic. And when this friend opened the door to see what Austin wanted, Austin just asked him, what year was I born? And so the friend says, uh, 
1996. And as soon as Austin heard this, he didn't give a reaction to it. He just turned around and he left. And so this longtime friend is looking at Austin walking away, wondering, you know, like, what's going on with this guy? Is he high on drugs? Is he drunk? Like, what was that? So the friend goes back inside his house and he's thinking to himself, you know, like, what should I do? And so after a couple of minutes, he decides, you know what, I, I got to call Austin and make sure he's OK. So he calls Austin, Austin picks up and it's unclear what they talked about on the phone. But the friend convinced Austin to come back to his house and to just spend the day with him. But really, the friend just wanted to make sure Austin was OK. And so Austin comes back to the friend's house and then the two of them actually would leave the house and meet up with some of their other friends that were in town that summer, as well as meet up with Austin's sister. And so the group, they decide they're going to go to the beach for the day. And on their walk to the beach, Austin tells the group that he just needs to get something at his house and that he will meet them down at the water. And so at this point, the group believes Austin is just fine. So they say, OK, yep, we'll meet you down there. And so Austin breaks off. He goes to his house. And when he goes back to the beach and meets up with his group of friends again, he's changed his outfit. He was now wearing this very thick, large football jersey. He was wearing long sweatpants that were also very thick. He had on two wristwatches and he had on sunglasses. And so as he walks down onto the beach, his friends look up at him and it's super hot out and they're at the beach. So this is a totally weird outfit to have on. And immediately they start kind of giving him crap about his strange outfit choice. But Austin did not think it was funny at all. And at first he was quiet, but then he kind of lashed out and said, if you tell me I'm crazy, I will kill you. And at this, his friends did not give him any more crap. Everyone just said, okay, man, hey, didn't mean anything by it. Just giving you a hard time, no big deal. But Austin's like clearly worked up. And so his sister comes over to him and she's like, hey, you know, calm down. It's okay. It's not a big deal. And during this conversation, Austin suddenly goes back to being normal again. And he turns to his sister and he says, I'm actually half horse and I'm immortal. And his sister's like, what? You really need to get professional help. You need to see a therapist or a psychologist or something. Something is wrong with you and it's been wrong all summer. You need to get help. Now, apparently Austin actually responded to this very positively. And he said, you know, I agree. Uh, there, there is something going on and I, and I do need to get help. You're right. And so after that, Austin and the rest of the group, they stayed at the beach for several hours. And then in the evening time, Austin, his sister and Austin's very close friend, who was the guy that saw Austin in the morning when he asked, you know, what year was I born? They all said they had to leave. And so the trio, they leave the beach and they head to Duffy's, which was a restaurant in town. And they were going there to meet up with Austin's father and his father's girlfriend. And so as they're getting to this restaurant, they're walking along the sidewalk, they're nearing this restaurant, when suddenly Austin turns to his sister and says, hey, I need to test out my immortality. And he just turns away from her, away from the sidewalk towards traffic and just starts walking into traffic like he's going to let a car hit him to test his immortality. And so his sister immediately was able to grab him and pulled him back onto the sidewalk and then basically stood on the left side of him, preventing him from running out into traffic and kind of pushed him along up the sidewalk right up to the front door of this restaurant. And when they got there, Austin had stopped trying to walk out into traffic. He was acting normal again. And it was there that the trio met up with Austin's father and his father's girlfriend friend and the five of them went into Duffy's restaurant. It was about 7.45 p.m. when they got inside and they were very quickly sat in the very back of the restaurant in this booth. And so there was a CCTV camera that watched them while they were inside this building. And so they're sitting at this booth and about three minutes after having sat down, Austin gets up and walks away from the booth and walks as if he's going towards the bathroom, but then stops, doesn't go to the bathroom, turns around and walks back towards the front of the building and then walks out the front doors, just leaves the restaurant altogether. Now, it's unclear if the rest of his family saw him do this. It doesn't seem like they did. But just a minute later, Austin comes back inside the restaurant and just walks right back to his table and sits down like nothing had ever happened. Less than 10 minutes later, Austin would get up again from his table, except this time, instead of feigning going to the bathroom, he just walks straight from his table right out the front doors of the restaurant and disappears. A couple minutes later, Austin's mother, who was not at dinner with them, she was at her home, which happened to be nearby this restaurant, she was home when she heard the sound of someone coming into her house. 
And so she went around to see who it was and she found her son, Austin, in her kitchen drinking vegetable oil and there was Parmesan cheese all over the counter that apparently he had been eating as well. And so she runs up to him and she grabs the vegetable oil and she puts it down and she tells him to stop, at which point Austin does stop. And then I guess Austin just went up to his room and he changed out of his clothes because perhaps he got oil all over his shirt. And then his mom just drove him back to the restaurant. And so she watched him get out of the car and she watched him go through the front door and then she drove off. And so about 30 minutes after he left that second time, Austin walks through the front doors of the restaurant. He's got a different shirt on, different hat on, and he just walks to the back of the restaurant where his sister, his friend, and his father and his father's girlfriend are, and he sits down like nothing had ever happened. At first, it looks like everyone at the table is just silent. But then Austin's father very clearly says something to Austin, and it seems kind of hostile. And it would turn out Austin's father, who loved his son, was just totally at a loss for what to do with him. And he said to Austin when he sat back down, what is wrong with you? And at this, Austin just stands up and presses his father's face back up against his seat, kind of pinning him there. And then at some point he just lets go, he leaves the booth and he walks right out of the restaurant for a third time. Austin's friend who was eating with them, he got up and kind of chased after Austin, but he was about 30 seconds behind him. And so by the time he got outside, he didn't know where Austin went. And so he quickly came back in the restaurant. He told the rest of the group he didn't know where Austin was. And so at this point, Austin's father's girlfriend would actually call the police and report Austin missing. They knew he was totally unhinged and they didn't know where he was gonna go, if he was a threat to himself or someone else. And so they figured they should just tell the police and have the police go find him. About four months miles away from this restaurant, 53-year-old Michelle Mishkon was sitting in her garage watching TV. Normally, she would be joined by her husband, 59-year-old John Stevens, but he was out walking their dog. So for the time being, Michelle was alone. The couple had been married for roughly 20 years. They had three kids together from previous marriages, and they were just totally in love with each other. That garage was like their happy place. That was basically like their living room. They loved having the door wide open so they could wave to neighbors and flag people down to have a drink with them or just chat with them. They were just known to be a very happy, loving couple that were fun to be around. And according to their kids, they had both recently retired. John retired from his landscaping company that he owned, and Michelle retired from her financial advisory job. And the two of them were apparently both just really excited about retirement life. They were excited to spend more time together and go out with their friends and go out fishing on their boat with their dog and then also spend as much time as they could just lounging back in their garage. John and Michelle's neighbor across the street was a middle-aged man named Jeff Fisher. Jeff was fairly close with the couple. He would usually watch their dogs anytime they went away and he would often go in their garage and have a drink and just kind of hang out with them. And so this particular night, he was over in his house and he was going to bed early. So he laid down in his bed, he's getting ready to go to sleep when he hears some strange sounds coming from outside his window across the street over near John and Michelle's property. And so Jeff sits up in his bed and kind of strains his ears to see what it was that he heard. And as he's trying to listen for some faint sound, he suddenly hears a blood curdling scream, a woman's scream coming from across the street. And so Jeff instantly leapt into action. He jumped out of his bed, he ran downstairs and he ran out his front door and he looked across the street and he saw this unknown man, some young man that was slamming the car door of Michelle's car that was parked in her driveway. And he begins walking up the driveway and at the top of the driveway, Jeff sees Michelle is standing in the garage and she looks totally terrified and she's facing this unknown young man. And of course, this unknown young man was Austin Harris. Now, Jeff had no idea what was actually going on. All he knew was he heard this scream, which was probably Michelle, and he's looking out there and he's seeing a situation that just doesn't look good. And so instinctively, he decided he would just run across the street and make sure Michelle was okay. And if he had to, he would confront this unknown man, Austin. So Jeff begins running across his property, trying to get across the street to Michelle. But before he could even get across the street, he's looking up and he can see this guy, Austin, has grabbed Michelle and thrown her on the ground. And now he's on top of her and he's beating her. And so Jeff runs onto the driveway and as he's going right up the driveway between the two cars that were parked there, Austin leaps off of Michelle. He turns around and he looks at Jeff and he says, you don't want a part of this. And now Jeff, 
Jeff, he's a pretty big guy. And so he's looking at Austin and he knows that if he doesn't do anything, this guy is just gonna continue pummeling poor Michelle. And he had no idea where John was. And so he ran up and kind of lunged at Austin. And as he did that, Austin swung and he hit Jeff right across the side of the head. But Jeff took the hit, he didn't fall down, he grabbed Austin by the collar and threw him as hard as he could to the ground. And Austin, he hit the pavement hard, face first. And so Jeff is looking at this guy, kind of thinking he's not gonna get up. But as he's assessing the situation, watching Austin stand back up again, Jeff suddenly feels a blinding pain in his face, in the side of his head, in his neck, on his back. And he looks down and he sees blood all over his arms. It's everywhere, he's covered in blood it would turn out Austin was carrying a knife. And so when he punched Jeff, that knife went into his face, it cut the side of his head, it cut his neck, and it cut his back. He had five different puncture points from that one swing. And so Jeff believed at the time this was a potentially fatal wound. He was worried perhaps his jugular had been struck and he was bleeding to death. And he's seeing Austin stand back up coming right after him with this knife. And so Jeff decides their only chance is for him to run and call the police. And so he runs into Michelle's property. He's thinking that he's kind of drawing this guy towards him away from Michelle. He runs into their property, kind of slams into all their doors. He goes out a back door and then he loops around the property and then he makes a run for it straight across the street to his house. Never once did he turn around to see if this guy was after him. He figured he was right behind him. He gets to his house, he runs inside, he locks the door and then he calls 911. Police and medical. Young man beating up a woman across the street. Are either of them injured? Can you tell from where you are? Yes, there's a girl laying on the ground. He beat her up. I ran over there. I'm bleeding profusely here at the moment. Okay. I don't know what happened. Can you tell if she's conscious? No, it does not appear so, no. Oh, I've been stabbed in the back. I'm bleeding pretty bad. After the call is placed and Jeff is certain that help is on the way, he's barely conscious, but all he can remember thinking was, I hope this maniac, Austin, has abandoned his attack and just run off. Or, I hope John has come outside and he's helping his wife. But unfortunately, all Jeff could hear was the sound of Austin across the street making these loud, animalistic grunting sounds. And at the same time, he hears the sound of someone screaming at the top of their lungs. He doesn't even know if it's one person, if it's two people, if it's male, if it's female. All he hears is screams and grunting sounds. And then seconds later, the police show up. The following narrative is the account of the second responding officer, who we'll just call Dan, and the first responding officer we'll just call Kristen. And so Dan, he comes flying down the street, he's got his sirens on, and he pulls in right behind Kristen's cop car, which is parked right out in front of John and Michelle's property. Kristen is already running up the driveway, her gun is out, she's getting ready to engage somebody at the top of the driveway. And so Dan, he hops out of his car, he's got his hand on his gun, and as he turns to run up the driveway, his view is obscured. There are two cars parked in the driveway, and so he can't see what's at the top of the driveway that Kristen is apparently getting ready to draw her gun on. But as he begins running up the driveway, he sees there is this massive six foot wide stream of blood just coming down the driveway. And so he goes around the left side of the left car. He goes up and he sees Kristen right at the top of the driveway. She's got her gun aimed at the ground right in front of the car. So he can't see what's in front of the car yet. He comes bombing around the left side right behind Kristen and he looks down at what she's aiming her gun at and he sees there's this man lying on the ground. His eyes are open. He's just laying there kind of stiff and he's looking up at Kristen and he's looking up at Dan and he's just quietly saying, please help me. The man on the ground was John Stevens and on top of John Stevens was Austin. He was kind of laying sideways on John's chest. He had his left arm wrapped around John's neck to kind of hold him in place and then he he had his right arm and he was doing something to John's face. But Dan couldn't really tell what he was doing. All he could take in was there was clearly an aggressor and they needed to get him off of the victim. But Kristen could not take the shot because if she did, she ran the risk of firing the bullet through Austin into John, killing John. And so Dan tells Kristen, hold on, I'm gonna tase him. And so he moves around Kristen to her left side. So he's positioned looking down at the back of Austin. He pulls out his taser and right before he shoots his taser into Austin's back, he sees what Austin is doing to John's face. 
With his free right hand, he was reaching into John's mouth and pulling his cheek out, kind of like a fish hook. He was pulling it out as far as he could, and then he was biting into John's cheek, and he was ripping out pieces of flesh and chewing and swallowing them. And from his position, Dan only saw this for a second, but he suddenly noticed, and Kristen, the other officer, would later confirm, there were all these chunks already missing from John's face. And so Dan kind of snapped out of what he was seeing and fired his taser into the back of Austin, but it did nothing. It had absolutely no effect. Austin was entirely focused on biting John's face. That was all he was doing. He wasn't even registering that there were cops with their guns drawn on him. It was like they weren't even there. And so Dan runs back around Kristen to the other side of her. He's now on her right side. So he's standing right next to the car, looking down at Austin's front. And he tells Kristen to kind of back up for a second. And then Dan winds up and kicks Austin square in the face, knocking his head off of John's face. But as soon as Austin comes off of John, he doesn't get up and try to fight with Dan. Instead, he just jumps back down, gets a deeper grip on John, and plunges his mouth back onto John's face. And so again, Dan winds up and boots Austin square in the face, knocking his head back. But again, he's totally unfazed. He doesn't want to attack the officers. He just wants to eat John's face. And so he goes right back down, gets a tighter grip. He goes back and he starts chewing on John's face again. And so Dan was just repeatedly kicking him in the face over and over and over again, right as another set of officers showed up and they had a canine, they had a dog. And so they come flying up, they kind of see the situation and Dan tells them, release the dog. And so sure enough, they release the canine. The canine clamps down on Austin's right arm, the arm that was fish hooking and kind of pulling John's face out. And the dog really got a good bite on his arm and yanked it away from John's face. But Austin just instantly ripped his arm back, doing severe damage to his arm from the dog's teeth and just repositioned himself and went back to biting John's face. And so the dog, just as it was trained, did another bite. It grabbed back on to Austin's arm and it pulled it off of John's body. And so his arm is back like this again. And Austin, again, unfazed, just yanks his arm out of the dog's teeth, again, shredding the muscles of his arm and gets back in position and continues to eat John's face. And then finally, the dog gets another bite into Austin's arm. And this time when the dog managed to yank Austin's arm away from John, Dan timed it so he booted Austin square in the face right as his arm was being pulled back. And he hit him hard enough that Austin actually flew off of John and landed on his back. And as soon as he was on the ground, Dan actually leapt over John and landed on Austin's face, smashing his head into the cement, which kind of stunned him for a second. And as soon as he was stunned, Dan whipped out his handcuffs, threw it over one of Austin's wrists, and began pulling him by the handcuff up the driveway away from John. But as soon as he had some separation and Dan went to put the other handcuff on Austin, Austin began fighting back and he looked up at Dan and he screamed, kill me, I'm eating humans, kill me. Dan didn't even know what to do. And so he's trying to put the other handcuff on him the whole time Austin is screaming, kill me, kill me. And so other officers had to run in. And then finally, after three other officers, officers came over, they were able to hold Austin down long enough to get both handcuffs on him. After Austin was finally restrained, the officers checked on the victims. They checked on Michelle, who was in the garage, and unfortunately, she was deceased. She had died from blunt force trauma, and John, even though he had been alive when the police first showed up, he had succumbed to the multitude of injuries he had sustained, from stabbings to beatings to having a portion of his face ripped off. It's believed after John came back from his walk, which would have been right after Jeff had been attacked and ran back to his house, John saw Austin in his garage attacking his wife and John ran in to try to save her. So ultimately John would die trying to save the woman that he loved. Their dog would survive the attack. It was unharmed and it was given to one of their children to take care of. And Jeff Fisher, the neighbor who tried to save John and Michelle, he would survive the attack and make a full recovery. After Austin was finally handcuffed and was laying restrained on the driveway, he suddenly became unresponsive. He was rushed to the hospital where it was determined he had drank some poisonous chemicals, most likely from inside of John and Michelle's garage. And that was what was causing his organs to fail. 
Ultimately, Austin would go into a coma for 11 days from whatever he ingested, but the doctors were able to save his life, and so he would come out of that coma, and he would make a full physical recovery. It was initially assumed that because of Austin's drug abuse history, that he must have been on some drug when he perpetrated this heinous crime. It was speculated that he could have been on bath salts or flaca, which are these synthetic hallucinogenic drugs, which are very powerful, and at the time, they were quite popular in Florida, and they'd caused some other users to go on these kind of wild, violent rampages. And so it seemed to make a lot of sense that he must have been on one of those. But when Austin's toxicology report finally came back, it showed he only had a very small amount of THC in his system, which is the drug found in marijuana, and then the other drugs that were in his system were all induced by the doctors and nurses at the hospital which meant at the time of this attack, Austin was effectively sober. When the police asked Austin, why did you do this? He initially said, I don't remember, I don't know, but eventually he would open up and he would tell this story that no sane person could possibly understand. He said after he left that restaurant where his family was that third time after he fought with his father and he stormed out, after that, he saw this dark figure outside with a white face and he knew immediately that this figure was evil. And so instinctively, Austin began running away from this evil figure. And so he ran about four miles into John and Michelle's neighborhood. And when he got to this neighborhood, a neighborhood he was not familiar with, that he didn't intend to go to on purpose, he just kind of wound up there, he said he saw this brightly lit up garage and he ran up into it, believing he could enlist the help of the people inside of this house and that they would help him defeat this evil figure that was lurking somewhere nearby. And so he runs up into this garage, which happens to be John and Michelle's garage, and Michelle is in there. John is not. He's out for the walk with his dog, and Austin approaches her and tries to get her to help him, but he probably came off looking completely insane, and Michelle screamed, at which point Austin said he believed Michelle was a witch, and so he pulled out his knife and he attacked her. And then after she fell to the ground, Austin said he drank a bottle of alcohol or something, which we now know was most likely very poisonous lawn chemicals that was just in the garage. After he drinks that bottle, he turns around and now he's looking out of the garage towards the street. And he said he saw this other figure in the doorway with a dog next to him. And then Austin said his mind just went blank. It's believed the figure he saw in the doorway was John Stevens returning from his walk, but we don't know for sure. And frankly, this story is pretty incoherent to begin with because it doesn't account for the fact that before John came back, Austin had been grappling with Jeff Fisher and stabbing Jeff Fisher, the neighbor. But Austin would say he has no recollection of encountering Jeff Fisher. He has no recollection of John or what he looked like. And he certainly doesn't remember biting John's face. And he had no memory of any interactions with police. He said that basically he turned around he sees this figure, this dog, and then his mind went blank. And then he woke up about two weeks later in the hospital. Now, when his story went public, a lot of people just were not willing to accept that story. They said he was making it up so he could plead insanity at his trial and get a lesser sentence. But a world-renowned forensic psychologist named Philip Resnick, who had worked on many high-profile cases before, he did a lengthy assessment of Austin, and he came to a very different conclusion than the public. In his 38-page report, Resnick points out the fact that Austin continued to bite John's face even when he was being openly threatened with being shot by the police officer standing right over him. He continued to bite John's face after he was tased. He continued to bite John's face after he was kicked in the head repeatedly. He continued to bite John's face after a dog repeatedly bit him. This all suggests that Austin was truly in a psychotic state when this attack occurred. A sane person, even under the influence of drugs, will retain a basic survival instinct. Instinct. They will try to protect themselves. So when there are guns pointed at them, or they're being physically harmed, or there's threats of violence, they'll do things to protect themselves. But Austin didn't. It was like he had no idea about anything else except John's face. Resnick specified that the type of psychotic episode that Austin was suffering from on the night of the attack is something called clinical lycanthropy delusions. 
Clinical lycanthropy is a very rare occurrence where an individual believes they are no longer human. And almost always, what they believe they are is something akin to a werewolf. And in Austin's case, it's not that hard to figure out why you might reach that type of conclusion. He had told his sister that he believed he was half horse, and then on a couple other occasions, he had told his other friends that he believed he was half dog. And then of course, on the night of the attack, after he killed Michelle, he pounced literally on John and began eating his face while making those loud animalistic <sighs> grunting sounds. This is behavior that is certainly on par with what you would expect a werewolf to do in a movie. But this was not a movie, this was real life. After Austin came out of his coma, but before he had been transferred to jail, he agreed to do an interview with the clinical psychologist TV personality Phil McGraw, better known as Dr. Phil. And during their 10 minute Zoom interview, Austin would break down and cry and say he was incredibly sorry to the family of the victims, that he didn't really know why it happened and that clearly there was something wrong with him and he needed help. And he just hoped they could find it in their hearts to eventually forgive him. But it's unlikely the family of the victims are going to forgive him anytime soon, especially when you consider they came out in an interview and said, I hope Austin makes a full recovery from his coma, that he has no brain damage, that he is totally A-OK, -okay, so he can be fully aware and lucid when they read him his sentence a sentence they hoped would be the death penalty. As of right now though, the family of the victims will just have to keep on waiting because Austin is still in jail awaiting trial. So that's gonna do it guys. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please invite the like button to come with you to the zoo. And then when you're there, accidentally spill honey on them and then push them into the bear enclosure.